Well, good morning, everybody. I hope that you're starting to make your way into the live stream. I'm very excited that we get to worship with each other this morning. Of course, it is different. Um, last week went well with our online service. Um, I know I was watching it from home, and I, I was greatly encouraged to see everyone who was in. Uh, and what a beautiful day it is that we get to come together uh, online and we get to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. Although not together in body, but we are together in spirit. Uh, so thank you for being a part of this today. Uh, as we get started, we just have a few announcements that I want to make known to you. Um, if you're not following um, our church Facebook page, please look it up and follow it as we're making announcements on there and through the emails and even our texting service that we've got going now. Um, if you're not getting any of those, uh, please email the church office or text Jacob or I, and we'll make sure that you're getting all of that information. Um, and especially, I hope you're reading those psalms for your calm uh, that Jacob has been putting out. He's been putting a lot of time and effort into those, and I'm very thankful for him. We are so blessed uh, that we have a preacher like Jacob. He's a fantastic man. Um, I've grown to just love and care for him so much, and I know every single one of you have as well. And be sure to write him an encouraging message and thank him for all that he's doing. Same for the elders. They are working behind the scenes day after day, making some decisions, praying together. Uh, pray for them. Let them know that you care for them, you love them, and that you're thinking about them during this time. Uh, another announcement is uh, the work of the church is still going, and we need your contributions. Um, we've sent out the link for the online contributions. Take advantage of that if you can. If not, uh, please make sure to drop your contributions off at the church building. Uh, Monday through uh, Thursday, we'll be there from 9 to 4. Um, if you can't come on those days, let us know. We'll come to your house and we can pick it up. However um, you can get that to us, please continue to do so. And again, if you have absolutely any need or you need anything done, uh, please do not hesitate. Uh, this is where we are showing each other that we are the church it's not about the church building but that we are being the church let us help uh, there are so many members who want to help and we want to utilize everyone's talents during this time where we can't meet in a church building together so if you have a need don't hesitate to let us know because we want to make that uh, fulfilled we want to get that done for you as we begin our worship together let's bow for a word of prayer and then we will go ahead and sing some songs together let's pray our God and our Father, we are thankful that we can come together in spirit at this time to worship and praise your name. You alone are God, and you alone are mighty and worthy, and we are so thankful that we serve a God like you. Father, in this time of pandemic, we pray that we can cast aside all the cares and worries of the world, and we can just enter into this period of worship with you. Father, ease our hearts, ease our minds, and ease our spirits and open them uh, to the songs that we're going to sing. Let us pour out our hearts and our spirits to you. And thank you so much for the technology that you've blessed us with so that we can do this together today. Father, be with us. Help us to enter into this period of worship together. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing a few songs together.
At this time, we're going to enter into a period of uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. So I'll give you a few moments to uh, gather the emblems so you can partake of this together uh, with all of us online. We can do so at the same time. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to open Isaiah 53 and read along with me as, as we think about um, what this Lord's Supper is and why we are meeting around the table and spirit and why we do so every single week. I want to read Isaiah 53 to you, and I want us to think about the suffering servant. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was a rich man with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. What a beautiful and perfect Savior it is that we serve. I'm thankful that he is seated he is seated at the right hand of God, that he intercesses for us, and that he took on the sacrifice for us. Now let's partake of the bread together, and let's remember the body of our precious Savior. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the bread of life which came out of heaven for us. We're thankful for the perfect life that he lived. And we're sorry that he had to bear all of our sins upon himself and to take the beatings that he took and to hang on the cross for us. But Lord, we know that he is risen and we know that he is at your right hand and we're thankful that we serve a living Savior. Be with us now as we partake of this bread and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we are thankful for this cup that we are about to partake of, which symbolizes the blood of our perfect Savior that cleanses our souls from any diseases. We're thankful that this blood justifies us and brings us closer to you. And we pray now as we drink of it that we will remember the blood that poured out from Jesus' body, that we will remember that that blood is living today and it's living within our lives. It's living within Christians worldwide and it's cleansing us of our sickness. We love you. We're thankful for this blood and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at this time, let's go ahead and sing uh, two more songs together, and then we will get into our lesson with each other.
As many of y'all know, I just recently got back um, from a fun spring break trip to Paris. Um, it was me, Amanda, and the McCullas, and we had a great trip there. Um, we knew going in that this whole COVID-19 thing uh, has been kind of bad, but Paris wasn't even on the list of places that the CDC recommended that you don't go. So we're thinking we're fine. <laughs> Nothing's going to come. We're going to be there. We're praying about this whole thing. Everything's going to work out. We're going to get there when we need to get there. We're going to come back when we planned on coming back. And all is going to be sunshine and rainbows. And we're going to have cool pictures of us touching the tip of the Eiffel Tower. And all is going to be good. And then Thursday morning um, at 2 a.m., <laughs> I wake up to 88 text messages um, with Melissa. I can hear her walking down the hall. And they knock on the door. And uh, they tell us, we've got to get back to the United States today. I mean, we literally can't wait. Uh, Donald Trump issued that uh, the nation was going to go in lockdown. You couldn't travel from other countries. And so immediately at 2 a.m. where my brain's doing this because um, I thought it was a big dream, I start to panic. I start to freak out. And my initial reaction is I need to not act freaked out because I need to act calm for my wife uh, so she doesn't get freaked out. So we have this whole situation happen. I'm going to explain in another video um, that I'll post on YouTube and you, you all can watch. But I was full of fear when I received this news. I was full of questions. I was full of anxiety and I was fearful and I wanted to act out of faith. I wanted to think that this virus wasn't a big deal and that the media was just blowing this whole thing out of proportion. And luckily, we got home. God guided us home. We made it home, and we are in two-week quarantine. And I'm thinking, man, this whole situation is just insane. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, it's all being blown out of proportion. And on top of that, Lads the Leaders is canceled. And then the restaurant started closing and more people were dying and the numbers start rising and then our assembly is canceled on Sunday mornings and then they say that this could stretch into the summer uh, so all of the the plans that we have for the youth group are, are crumbling and it feels like someone has laid you down on a beach and that's fun when when you're being buried alive and you know what's happening that's a fun time but it's like someone's laid you down on the beach and they start pouring sand on you and at first it's not very serious but then they they keep pouring that sand on you and then you you realize that you're you can't really move um, and then they keep pouring more and you realize that your face is being covered up and you can't really breathe and they keep pouring more and it's to the point where it's completely overtaken you and you don't know what to do and you're completely covered and, and then you're still. You're completely still and you realize that you have absolutely no control of the situation. And then you start to recognize something. I'm not in control. I never have been in control and I never will be in control. But not being in control isn't a bad thing. Because the one who is in control knows exactly what this pandemic is going to do for us. God knows what's going to come from COVID-19 and from this entire pandemic. And we don't. And unfortunately, we may lose jobs. We may lose interactions for a while. We may be worshiping online together for a while. But praise God that this isn't the only life that we live. We look forward to a new heavens and a new earth where only righteousness will dwell and where there will be no more sickness, there will be no more heartaches, there will be no more sorrow. And I've got to say that there's been a lot of sad and difficult things that have come as a result of this worldwide pandemic. But there's been a lot of good that has come as well. Last Sunday when I got on Facebook, 
I didn't see anything but live streams of worship and Bible classes and pictures of people worshiping all over my timeline. And this has opened our eyes to see what true worship is. It never has and it never will be about the church building. Worship is not about the place. It's about the heart. And I have seen genuine Christianity come from this. I have seen people bearing the fruits of the Spirit uh, all over the world. I've seen it on on the internet uh, and examples of uh, people posting pictures and videos. And one of the fruits that I want us to focus on this morning is the fruit of love. I have seen love in ways that has literally brought tears to my eyes. I have seen members at our church doing kind things for other members. I saw Melissa Lovelace showing her infectious loving spirit uh, by bringing people candy and putting on a bubble show for them outside of their home. I've seen Jacob work countless amounts of hours putting together devotionals and lessons and getting communion out to people so that we could feast together in spirit each Sunday morning. I've seen the elders get together and discuss the plans for the church and how uh, they've prayed for the congregation, how they've served the members of the congregation during this time. I've seen multiple members check in on Amanda and I and bring us groceries and food and run errands for us. I've seen families interacting with the Word of God and worshiping together one of the most vulnerable times of their life. And I have seen love. And by seeing this love, it's reminded me of something extremely essential that we all need to understand and recognize about Jesus. And it's our central thought for this lesson. Jesus wasn't driven by fear. He was driven by love. In moments of fear and heartache, Jesus didn't let fear drive his emotions. He let love be the driving force. And you might be saying, you know... Jesus wasn't in the middle of a pandemic like we're in. Jesus wasn't at risk of losing his job. Jesus wasn't facing a virus spreading all around the world the way we're facing today. Jesus isn't having his plans being canceled. Jesus didn't have to worry about homeschooling his kids or kids and trying to find kids babysitters. And you're right. Jesus didn't face this kind of pandemic, but he faced a whole, a whole other pandemic. Jesus was in the midst of lepers. Jesus was around men and women who struggled to get food on the table. Jesus was constantly around sick people. Jesus saw people die. Jesus wept. Uh, Jesus lost friends. Jesus had things that he wanted to do but he couldn't do. Jesus had a mission. And he had his eyes set to Jerusalem to take on the cross so that 2,000 years later, while we are in the middle of a pandemic like this, we could have hope. And the entire time that Jesus had his eyes set towards Jerusalem, he had one main driving force that kept him going, and it was his love. Jesus loved people. And although he was in several moments where he could have been fearful and let fear drive his emotions, he used love instead. So for the rest of our time together, I want us to observe some of those situations and let's see how we can love like Jesus in times of fear. The first scenario of Jesus letting love be his driving emotion instead of fear is found in Matthew chapter 26. If you want to turn there with me, let's look at chapter 26 verses 36 through 46 together. And this situation is Jesus praying in the garden. And this situation that we see Jesus in is one of the most vulnerable times in his life. Yet he knew it was coming. So as we set the scene, let's go back and think about what has just happened. He was in the upper room with his 12 apostles. He announces that one of them would betray him, which Matthew sets up for us. And we know that it's Judas. He goes on to institute the Lord's Supper. He gives them the bread and he gives them the cup. And then they sing a hymn and they make their way towards the Mount of Olives. 
But while all of these events are going on, Jesus is looking around the room. And when he sees Judas, he knows that in just a few moments that Judas is going to show up with the crowd and they're going to arrest Jesus. Jesus loved his people unconditionally. He could have told Andrew, James, and John and the rest of the disciples to jump Judas and have him beaten for betraying their master. Jesus could have gone somewhere else to pray. But he walked straight to the Garden of Gethsemane where him and his disciples met often. And when he gets there, notice he separates himself from the ones he loves the most. And he goes off and he prays to the Father alone. Why do you think he did that? Have you ever been in a moment or a situation where your heart is heavy, you're uncertain about the things that are about to happen, and you're anxious, and you just need to talk to God? Uh, You're probably going to separate yourself from people uh, because you need that alone time with God. You just need to pour your heart out to Him. You just need to talk to Him. Jesus teaches us that sometimes the way you show someone you love them is by pulling away from them for a moment and not letting your vulnerable ones see you in a moment of uncertainty and fear. So not only do we see Jesus showing love in the midst of fear by pulling away from his disciples, we see his love in what he goes on to say to the Father. That's found in verse 39. And he says, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Please don't make me go through this. If there is any other way, any other way, let me see it and let me do that. And you may have prayed this prayer recently. You may have a lot going on in your life and you don't see how you're going to make it through the situation that you're facing and you're wanting it to be any other way but this. And that's okay to wish that and to pray that. But notice how Jesus concludes this thought. Yet not as I will, but your will be done. Father, I love you. I love my people. And I will do whatever it takes to prove them that I love them. I don't want it to be this way. But if this is what needs to happen, I will do it for my people. And that's what motivates Jesus to get up and to walk straight into the hands of his betrayer. Which brings us to the second instance where Jesus didn't let fear drive his emotions, but he was driven by love. And that's... Jesus healing the servant's ear after Peter cut it off. So as Jesus is getting up, he sees the crowd coming towards him and they're seeking after him. And Judas walks up and and kisses Jesus on the cheek as a sign of betrayal. He let the crowd know who they needed to arrest. And then one of them asks if They should start attacking with the sword, which we learn to be Peter. And then Peter goes on to cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, whose name was Malchus. But why a sword? Why would Peter ask Jesus if they can start attacking with a sword? Well, we've got to back up a little bit. Because earlier in the Gospels, Peter tells Jesus that he will die for you. In other words, he tells Jesus... I will go to war with you, Jesus. And Peter thought that this was that moment. This is where his thought of an earthly Messiah who is going to restore Jerusalem, kick the Romans out of town, and restore Jerusalem to its perfect form, and him and his Messiah were going to reign forever. That's where this thought came out. It's wartime. I am ready to die fighting for you, Jesus. I know you're going to protect me. Let's go to war together. And this is his moment to prove it. And what Peter saw happen next is something that he never thought he'd see. His master turned and looks at him and tells him to put up his sword. He walks up to Malchus and he heals his ear. (laughs) I see love there. 
I see love in the midst of fear. I don't see selfishness. I see selflessness. Are you seeing that in your life during this pandemic? Are we scrambling to make sure we've got everything we need during this time in abundance for ourselves first? Are we think or are we thinking about the members in our congregation who can't get out? Are we reaching out to those in the community who know who we know are probably struggling? Uh, are we praying prayers that lift other people up or are we just praying for ourselves and, and for our family? Are we seeing attacks on Facebook and, and eager to jump in or are we trying to heal those who were just attacked? And Jesus had every right to look at Malchus's ear and, and just see it bleed and watch it bleed all the way to Annas' house and walk over and praise Peter for what he had done. He had every right to let Peter keep going and to join him and kill every single one of them. But that's not what Jesus was about. And Christians, that's not what we should be about. Jesus wanted us to see that even in the midst of absolute betrayal and absolute fear, that love wins. Do you see love winning in your life in the midst of fear? I hope we do. I hope I see that in my life. And as we come to the close of Jesus' life, we see a few things unfold. Jesus goes a few places. He gets beaten and scourged. He gets questioned and ridiculed. He has to carry his cross to his final execution location, but can't make it all the way there, so someone bears his cross for him. Then we get to Golgotha, and we see the final instance of Jesus letting love be the driving force instead of fear. That's seen over in Luke chapter 23, if you want to turn there. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 49 is where we see this occur. And in this section of scripture, I see love like I've never seen before, especially in verse 34. Jesus has been wronged. He has been falsely accused. He has received punishment that shouldn't have been dealt to an innocent and perfect man. And he pleads this earth-shattering statement to the Father in verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Wow. In the midst of fear, Jesus chose love and redemption. He could have asked the Father to strike every evil person down, and it would have happened like that. He could have told the Father to let all those people rot in hell for doing those things to him. But he chose love and asked that they would be forgiven and have another shot in life. Do we choose love? When someone takes the last carton of eggs, don't destroy them with your words. When someone cuts you off in traffic, don't try to drive them off the road and do something hateful. When someone does you just flat wrong, forgive them. Let love be your driving force and and be like Jesus. Be bold. Be different. And as Jesus is hanging there on the cross, and it's getting harder and harder to breathe, He knew that his work has been fulfilled. But he knew something that we all need to remember. And it's that there is something greater on the other side. There was something far beyond what he saw while he was hanging on the cross. No more pain, no more ridicule, no more being spat on, no more sickness, no more weeping, no more diseases, no more injuries, no more uncertainty. He was ready to enter into the presence of the Father. And do you believe that this morning? Do you want that this morning? In the midst of fear, do you let love drive you through the current situation that we are all in together and look forward to your next life? When Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, he was confident that he knew where he was going. And at the end of your life, when you say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, are you confident that from that moment on you will be with him forever? Are you unsure about that? 
this worldwide pandemic has opened a lot of eyes. It's opened my eyes to see that this life really isn't all that great. It's helped us to see that we live in a fallen and dark world. It's helped us to see that we're really not in control. It's helped us to see that the athletes aren't God. It's helped us to see that celebrities aren't God. It's helped us to see that musicians aren't God. And we are all prone to disease and sickness, no matter how much money we have, no matter how many followers we have, or how much success we have. We are not God. But Jesus is God. And in the midst of fear and chaos, he took on the cross as his final showcase of love, not just for you and not just for me, but for every single person that ever has and ever will live in this world. And it reminds me of John chapter 15, verse 13, where Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. I want us to ponder this question together as we come to a close. How can I be like Jesus? The answer is I lay my life down for others. I be a servant towards others. I care for others. I show compassion to others. I feel empathy for others. I pray for others. I show others my love. I text them, I call them, I visit them, I bring them groceries, I bake them cookies, I bring them eggs, I show them my love. If we want to be like Jesus, we need to love like Jesus and treat others the way that Jesus would treat them. And the final thing I want us to leave with together, especially during this time, fall in love with Jesus. There is not a better time than now to be still and know that He is God. Find out what that means. Find out who He is. Open your Bible. Take time to meditate on His Word. Pray to Him. Ask for wisdom to better understand Him and His Word. And let's look to Him as a perfect example of not letting our lives be driven by fear, but that our lives can be driven by love. I'm so thankful for every single person that's watching this. I love you. I care about you. And I want to see you on the other side of this as the strongest Christian that you've ever been in your life. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for my wife. That's my prayer for every single member at the Dripping Springs Church of Christ. Let's end with a prayer together. Our Father, we come before you now thankful for who Jesus is and for the way he conducted his life while he was on earth. It is our prayer that we can be more like Jesus, that as we are in this current moment of fear and uncertainty, that we don't let that fear make the decisions for us, but we make all of our decisions based on love. Help us to love more. Help us to love deeper and stronger. And help us to fall more in love with you and to see how you're working through this entire situation. Be with us. Guide us. Thank you for letting us worship you together today. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope that uh, this was a encouraging and enriching time for you and for your family. And I'm looking forward to the day where we can get back together and meet with each other again. But until then, uh, I love you and I care for you. If you have anything that you need done, please let me know. Please let Jacob know. Please let the elders or the deacons know. We want to serve you and we want to care for you and let you know that we are there for you. Let's continue to be the church. Let's continue to bear great fruit of the Spirit during this trying time. God bless you and go with God.
be free from your past.